I love cricket. I've spent nearly two years of my life actually on a cricket field, playing over 500 games for my club alone. I play county level at school and know some first class cricketers. There's no game that can touch it. Play up. Team spirit. Fair play. I went to matches for years at Lord's and saw the arena change out of all recognition. I met the great commentator Brian Johnson a few times and spoke with him about our affection for the game. But I'm ashamed of what's happened to the game I love. The match-fixing scandals involving the captains of South Africa, India and Pakistan were bad enough. Mervyn Westfield of Essex has been inside prison for throwing games. And of course, the three Pakistanis who fixed the Lord's Test of 2010 shamed the game even more. A friend who played first-class cricket told me years ago that fixes in county games were fairly common, especially near the end of season when many players were just going through the motions. There's also umpire nobbling cases coming to light. Cricket is mired in match fixing. You can't believe in what you're seeing. But the following scandal is, I believe, more shameful to English cricket than any of the match fixing shenanigans. It involved selling the English national side to an international fraudster for money. This selling was perpetrated by the chairman of the English cricket board who should hang his head in shame. But he didn't, and brazenly stood for re-election and was elected unopposed. That says something about the state of the game of cricket now. It's all about money. And Giles Giles Clark, CBE, is plugged into lots of it. He's an English businessman and chairman of the England and Wales Cricket Board. He reputedly gambled and paid his way through University at Oriel Oxford by playing backgammon and bridge. Clark started business life as an investment banker. He's made several fortunes building up companies and selling them, and has also worked for various quangos. Clark is the man who sold all live TV rights to Sky, and in the process robbed the public of test cricket, unless you want to pay a subscription. My interest in cricket was nurtured by watching test matches live on television every summer but disadvantaged children can no longer enjoy this pleasure. Thanks very much, Mr. Clark. In June 2008, the ECB did a deal with another risk-taking businessman, supposed billionaire Sir Alan Stanford. An England eleven would play the Stanford's All-Stars for a winner-takes-all purse of $13 million on top of the $3.5 million the ECB received for sending a team to play at Stanford's ground in Antigua. Less than a year later, Stanford was facing fraud charges in the United States and is now serving 110 years in prison for massive fraud. They don't mess around in America. Yet Giles Clark refused to take any blame for the fiasco. He's obviously a good judge of character. Perhaps he recognised a kindred spirit in Stanford. Leicestershire chairman Neil Davidson said that Clark bore the brunt of responsibility. This is the England cricket team. It's not some cavalier outfit. The image of the English cricket team is absolutely vital for participation and interest in the game. The powers that be rented it out for a prize fight. That's not how the game should be run. Giles Clark recently told the Cricketer magazine I'm not going to talk about Stanford. Stanford is a thing of the past. Stanford is a small, single matter. But English cricket fans will have no trouble recalling the vulgarity of the day in June 2008 when Stanford landed his helicopter on the nursery ground at Lord's to be greeted as a conquering hero by the game's top brass despite concerns among United States officials that his wealth had been acquired dishonestly. Onlookers were then treated to Stanford and his so-called ambassadors, salivating over a box full of $50 bills amounting to $20 million. A county chairman added, I remember at the time how repulsed I was by the whole thing, this guy flying in with a perspex box full of $20 million. The whole thing stank from the get-go. It just looked wrong. It was atrocious and embarrassing. Ian Botham and Viv Richards were heroes of mine. They still are. 
It was sad to see them lined up alongside businessmen Stamford and Clark, having to smile at a box of fraudsters' money. Needless to say, the money wasn't even real. It was fake. Worse was to come when the England Eleven, well aware of public distaste for the adventure, moped around Antigua before losing by ten wickets to Alan Stamford's All-Stars. And Stamford didn't exactly ingratiate himself with the players either, wandering uninvited into their dressing room and then bouncing Matt Pryor's wife on his knee. Clark and Collier argued that they had done the deal in good faith and insisted the ECB had carried out sufficient due diligence on Stanford's past. It emerged, however, that due diligence amounted to checking the American had enough funds to bankroll a five-year deal. Graham Gooch likened the Stanford Super Series to the film Indecent Proposal. One of the great West Indian cricketers, who did not want to be named, told the Daily Telegraph, the ECB should move their offices to the red light district in Amsterdam because they have prostituted themselves. The cricket boards of India and South Africa reportedly refused to deal with Stamford. Surely that should have rung enough potential alarm bells? In any normal organisation, the chairman's position would be untenable in these circumstances, said Neil Davidson. As the journalist Shield Berry wrote, and always there will remain those photographs of Stanford being revered as a king when his helicopter landed at the home of cricket, on the very turf of lords, of courtiers bowing and scraping, of the Cheshire cat smiling in front of the crate of twenty million dollars and thinking how much Stanford was worth. Nothing can efface the embarrassment of those photographs. And Clark was by no means alone, as cricket reflected the times. Clark refused to resign because of the controversy, saying that Stanford would not be his legacy. To many of us, Stanford will always be associated with the reign of Clark, and for all the wrong reasons. Now perhaps the chairman of the English Cricket Board, or is that the Cricket Board of England and Wales, uh, should seek to emulate a past president of the MCC. This gentleman, uh, Colin, shall we call him, he captained Hampshire, and he was a thoroughly decent chap. One evening, when he was president of the MCC, he hosted a very boozy dinner at Lord's. Very drunk, and very late at night, he got into his Bentley and went out of the North End Gate. Absolutely paralytic and unable to see very much at all, he put his near side wheels into the gutter so that he could use the pavement to guide himself by. But he drove so slowly that a policeman overtook him on foot and waved him down. Smelling his breath, but recognizing that this was a man of some breeding, the policeman very politely asked, Sir, do you think in your condition that it is wise to drive? Colin replied, For God's sake, officer, I'm far too fucking pissed to walk.